Throughout your power plant, temperature, heat, and their effects are important factors in ensuring that plant systems run properly. Temperature is measured and monitored in every phase of the energy conversion process. So it's important to know how temperature can affect the way plant machinery and equipment work. Heat is also measured and used in all areas of plant operation. In this unit, we'll investigate what temperature and heat are, how temperature and heat are measured and how temperature and heat affect plant functions. Temperature can be defined as the degree of hotness or coldness measured on a definite scale. Our simplest understanding of temperature comes from our sense of touch. We tell whether an object is hot or cold in comparison to the temperature of our bodies. If the temperature of an object is higher than our body temperature, we sense that it is hot and we can become familiar with the temperature of an object to the point where we can tell if the temperature is about what it should be. For example, while making routine inspections in your plant, you will be able to touch the bearing housings of machinery and have a good idea if the bearing temperature is right. But just being able to tell if the temperature of machinery is correct is not enough. You need to understand the way that temperature affects equipment so that you can be able to predict the results of temperature changes. Now, the temperature of fluids and machinery and power plants continuously increase and decrease. So the effects of temperature variations must be considered in the design of plant machinery. For instance, one effect of temperature variation is a change in the physical size of matter. Most solids, liquids, and gases expand as their temperature increases and contract as temperature decreases. But during this expansion and contraction, their weight stays the same. Now, if the temperature of a solid, liquid, or gas increases and the matter is not allowed to expand, its pressure increases. So throughout plant systems where increases in pressure must be kept within specified limits, Equipment and machinery are designed to allow for the expansion that results from increases in temperature. Steam lines, turbines, and boilers are three examples that we'll look at. Expansion loops are used in steam lines to allow the steam pipe to expand as it heats up without breaking. If the pipe did not have room to expand, stress on the pipe would increase and it could break. A second way of providing for expansion and contraction of pipes is to put an expansion joint in the pipe. This is one type of expansion joint. The corrugated center is made of a strong but pliable material which allows the motion that results from expansion and contraction of the pipe. As the pipe gets hotter, it expands and becomes longer, pushing the corrugation together. When the pipe cools, it contracts and the corrugations are elongated. Both expansion loops and expansion joints allow for expansion and contraction of piping systems. However, other plant components must also be designed and equipped to allow for the effects of temperature changes. Turbines are one example. A typical turbine may have three sections, an HP or high pressure section, an IP, or intermediate pressure section, and an LP, or low pressure section. The turbine shell of each turbine section must be allowed to expand or contract as temperature changes. Otherwise, the shell could crack from stress. One way of allowing expansion and contraction is to anchor only part of the turbine so that the other part is free to move. In a typical three-section turbine, there are two anchor points between the HP and the IP sections. The IP and LP sections are joined so that they move together. The lower parts of the turbine shell, which aren't anchored, rest on skid plates that allow each shell to move along its support bed as it expands or contracts. Now, the expansion and contraction has to be uniform throughout the turbine shell. 
If one area of the shell expands more than another, it could cause buckling and cracking of the shell. To avoid this problem, turbine startup procedures are specifically designed to allow all areas of the turbine shell to warm up to a uniform temperature. As long as you follow these procedures and observe the instrumentation provided, the temperature across the shell should be the same and the amount that the shell expands or contracts should be uniform. Another example where expansion and contraction take place is a boiler. In a typical boiler, the temperature in the furnace may approach several thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the water walls won't get that hot because the water passing through cools them. But during operation, the water walls may get very hot. When the boiler is shut down, the water wall temperature may be as low as the room temperature. When the boiler is started up, the large increase in temperature causes the water walls to expand, sometimes as much as one foot. To allow for this expansion, the water walls are frequently hung from the top, leaving enough space for them to expand downward toward the floor. There are many examples of components and equipment that expand and contract with variations in temperature. We've looked at a few. The general rule to remember is that with a rise in temperature, things expand, and with a drop in temperature, they contract. There are some exceptions, though, such as ice. To a certain point, water behaves according to the expansion-contraction rule. It expands as its temperature rises and contracts when it is cooled. But when water freezes and becomes ice, it expands instead of contracting as its temperature decreases. If the water in a pipe freezes, it will try to expand. If expansion is prevented, pressure will increase. If the pressure exerted is great enough, the pipe could rupture. And for this reason, lines that carry water, which might be exposed to low temperatures, are usually heat traced to prevent freezing. There are two ways that a pipe can be heat traced, electrical heat tracing or steam heat tracing. Lines that are electrically heat traced are wrapped in a special tape that has an electrical heating element in it. The tape provides just enough heat to prevent the water in the pipe from freezing. The tape is made more effective by wrapping insulation around the pipe and the heat tracing. In steam heat tracing, a small pipe carrying low pressure auxiliary steam is run alongside the main line that carries the water. Both pipes are covered with insulation. The heat from the trace line keeps the temperature in the main line above freezing. Now, as the steam passes through the trace line, it cools and begins to condense. If the condensate is not removed, it will collect and prevent steam from passing through the pipe. Steam traps prevent this from happening. A steam trap is a device that allows water to be drained, but prevents steam from escaping. In this way, condensate is removed and a continuous supply of steam is ensured. As long as steam is available or the electrical heat tracing tape is working, the pipe shouldn't freeze. But occasionally something might go wrong. For instance, the electrical element and the heat tracing tape may fail and the water in the pipe could freeze. Re-establishing heat tracing will thaw the line but you may not be able to put the heat tracing back into service. If the line must be operated, you may have to thaw the pipe using a torch. Only use a torch in an area where an open flame is permitted and always follow established plant procedures. We can see the importance of following the proper procedure for thawing if we look at this drawing of the inside of the pipe. The proper procedure is to start at one end at an open drain valve and begin thawing along the line from that point. If thawing is begun in the middle of the line, as in this drawing, the water formed by the melting ice is trapped by the ice that surrounds it. As the temperature of the water increases, the normal reaction would be for the water to expand. 
but this expansion is blocked by the ice on either side, and the result is an increase in pressure, which could cause the pipe to rupture. But by beginning the thawing process at an end of the line where there is an open valve, the water flows out of the pipe as the ice melts, and the line is eventually cleared without damage. Thawing a pipe by applying heat shows the effect that a difference in temperature has on heat flow. Heat always flows from warmer areas toward cooler areas. Whenever there's a difference in temperature, there is a flow of heat. For example, when an alarm such as this one goes off signaling that a motor is too hot, the operator may have to shut it down to stop the heat buildup. He knows that the motor will eventually cool down because the heat will flow from the hot motor to the cooler air which surrounds it. The motor will lose heat until its temperature and the air temperature are the same. Well, in this segment, we've talked about what temperature is, some of the effects of temperature changes, and some ways plant components are designed to handle temperature changes. We also said that the temperature of an object can be evaluated by touching it. Well, sometimes machinery in the plant is too hot to touch, or the temperature needed is inside a component where it can't be reached by hand. So temperature measuring instruments must be used in order to get precise temperature readings. These instruments use several types of temperature scales, which we'll talk about in the next two segments. For now, we'll stop and let you review the material in your text and answer the text questions. Your instructor will help you with any questions you have. Power plant operators are required to take temperature measurements from many components in the plant. Temperature measuring instruments, such as thermometers, are used to monitor and display temperature. But throughout plant systems, different types of thermometers and different measurement scales are used. Since you may need to compare temperatures that use different scales, you'll need to become familiar with them in order to be able to make decisions on whether equipment is running properly. There are two types of thermometers that are most commonly used in power plants. These are bimetallic and liquid-filled thermometers. They both work on the principle that matter expands when temperature increases and contracts when temperature decreases and that the rate of contraction and expansion varies with different materials. Bimetallic thermometers use the fact that different kinds of metals expand and contract at different rates with changes in temperature. Two strips of different kinds of metal are joined together. When temperature increases, one strip expands more than the other, causing the bimetallic strip to bend. If temperature decreases, the strip bends in the opposite direction. The amount that the strip bends depends on the amount of temperature change. The strip moves a dial, which is calibrated to indicate the actual temperature being measured. The temperature displayed depends on the amount of expansion or contraction of the bimetallic strip. Liquid-filled thermometers are a type that you are probably very familiar with. They are made up of a sealed glass tube that is partially filled with liquid, usually mercury or alcohol. The tube is attached to a reservoir, which may also be called a bulb. The liquid in the tube and the bulb expands or contracts in response to temperature. The liquid expands causing the liquid level to rise when temperature increases and contracts, causing the liquid level to fall when temperature decreases. A calibrated scale is attached alongside the tube and temperature values are assigned to specific levels of the liquid in the tube. Now these temperature values or scales are really what we use to evaluate how hot or cold something is we become familiar with the temperature associated with a number on a scale. There are four different scales that you may work with in your plant. 
Each scale expresses temperature in units called degrees. We'll talk about two of these scales in this segment, the Celsius scale and the Fahrenheit scale. These are the scales that are most commonly used to measure normal everyday temperatures. The value expressed by each degree varies between these two scales, but both scales use the same reference points for establishing the amount of temperature change between each degree. Now, these reference points are the freezing point and the boiling point of water. On the Celsius scale, the temperature change between the freezing point and the boiling point of water is divided into 100 equal degrees. The freezing point of water is set at zero degrees Celsius. The little circle stands for degrees and the C stands for Celsius. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. A reading of 25 degrees Celsius means that the temperature is 25 degrees above the freezing point of water, and a reading of minus 25 degrees Celsius means the temperature is 25 degrees below the freezing point of water. Now the Fahrenheit scale divides the temperature change between the freezing and boiling points of water into 180 equal degrees. And the freezing point of water is set at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes the boiling point 32 plus 180, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The 32 degree Fahrenheit point is where pure water freezes. Water can be made to freeze at a lower temperature by adding salt to it. The zero point on the Fahrenheit scale was established by obtaining the lowest possible temperature at which a concentrated salt water solution freezes. The salt lowers the freezing point by 32 degrees. In most plants, the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales may be used interchangeably. Therefore, you'll need to know how to convert between them. For instance, the temperature of a transformer is usually measured in degrees Celsius. The transformer's temperature is affected in part by the ambient temperature, which is the temperature of the surrounding air, because the air is used to cool the transformer. The ambient temperature is usually read in degrees Fahrenheit. If the ambient temperature increases, so should the temperature of the transformer. And if ambient temperature decreases, the transformer's temperature should also decrease. So in order to tell if increases and decreases in the transformer's temperature are properly related to increases and decreases in ambient temperature, it's necessary to compare the two. And since the transformer temperature is measured in degrees Celsius and ambient temperature is measured in degrees Fahrenheit, you must convert between degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit in order to get an accurate comparison. Now, one way of converting degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit is to multiply degrees Celsius by 9 fifths and add 32. And degrees Fahrenheit can be converted to degrees Celsius by subtracting 32 from degrees Fahrenheit and multiplying by 5 ninths. You may want to use a decimal equivalent for 5 ninths. The two equations for this are degrees Fahrenheit equals 32 plus 1.8 times degrees Celsius and degrees Celsius equals degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. We'll be doing some calculations using this equation. Let's consider a situation where the temperature of the transformer is 60 degrees Celsius and the ambient temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the ambient temperature increases to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we would expect the transformer temperature to increase, but the question is, how much of an increase is normal? Now, we can figure this out only if we can compare temperature on the same scale. We can do this by converting the ambient temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit 
to degrees Celsius. The equation is 77 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. This equals 25 degrees Celsius. We can now find the difference between the transformer temperature and ambient temperature, which is 60 degrees Celsius minus 25 degrees Celsius. The difference is 35 degrees Celsius. Now this tells us that we can normally expect the difference between ambient and transformer temperature to be 35 degrees Celsius, as long as the load on the transformer remains the same. So if the ambient temperature increases from 77 degrees Fahrenheit to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a nine degree increase, we can expect the transformer temperature to increase by a similar amount. But it won't be nine degrees because the two temperatures are not on the same scale. But by putting the ambient temperature in degrees Celsius, we can accurately predict about how much the transformer temperature will rise. We already know that 77 degrees Fahrenheit equals 25 degrees Celsius. To convert 86 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, we subtract 32 from 86 degrees Fahrenheit and divide by 1.8. We get 30 degrees Celsius. Ambient temperature rose 5 degrees Celsius from 25 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. So we would expect that the transformer temperature would rise from 60 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius and not to 69 degrees Celsius, which we might think if we didn't convert ambient temperature to degrees Celsius. Now, the difference between 65 degrees Celsius and 69 degrees Celsius is not that large, but it could be the difference between thinking everything is fine and knowing something is wrong. And if the temperature difference is even larger, the error you'd make in not converting would also be larger. Okay, now in this segment, we've looked at some types of thermometers used in power plants and how they work. And we've talked about two different types of temperature scales. But because these scales use zero points below which measurement of temperature is still possible, they can't be used in certain types of calculations. You may recall that in the last unit, we used an absolute temperature scale for pressure, volume, and temperature calculations. We did this because it's necessary to use absolute temperature scales in these calculations. In the next segment, we'll talk about two absolute temperature scales. But we'll stop here and give you some practice converting between the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales. Be sure to read your text and answer the questions. And ask your instructor to help you if you have any problems. The motion of molecules, which is determined by the amount of energy in the form of heat that an object contains, has a great influence on the temperature of the object. The higher the temperature is, the faster the molecules move. As the temperature decreases, the movement of the molecules slows. When molecular motion stops, the amount of heat the object contains is zero, and the temperature is at its lowest measurable point. Now this point is called absolute zero. Two common temperature scales which have zero points corresponding with absolute zero are the Kelvin scale and the Rankine scale. You may remember from an earlier tape that we used degrees Rankine when calculating pressure, volume, and temperature changes. We could not use the Celsius or Fahrenheit scales because our results would have been wrong. Each absolute scale is related to either the Celsius or the Fahrenheit scale. The Rankine scale is related to the Fahrenheit scale. In the last segment, we said that a degree is a unit reflecting a certain amount of temperature change and that the Fahrenheit scale divides the temperature range between the freezing and boiling points of water into 180 equal degrees. Well, the amount of temperature change reflected by one degree on the Rankine scale 
is equal to the amount of change reflected by one degree on the Fahrenheit scale. But the Rankin scale begins at absolute zero. You may remember that absolute zero is equivalent to minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, the Rankin scale is the Fahrenheit scale with 460 added to each number. So the conversion formula from Fahrenheit to Rankin is degrees Rankin equals degrees Fahrenheit plus 460. And to convert Rankin to Fahrenheit, it's degrees Fahrenheit equals degrees Rankin minus 460. This chart shows the relationship between the Fahrenheit and Rankin scales. Absolute zero is minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees Rankin. Zero degrees Fahrenheit is 460 degrees Rankin. The freezing point of water measures 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 492 degrees Rankin. And the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit and 672 degrees Rankin. If we wanted to convert the average human body temperature from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Rankin, we would use the conversion formula degrees Rankin equals degrees Fahrenheit plus 460. The average human body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit plus 460 equals 558.6 degrees Rankin. Okay, now let's look at the Kelvin absolute temperature scale. The Kelvin and the Celsius scales are related to each other in the same way the Rankin scale corresponds to the Fahrenheit scale. The Kelvin temperature scale begins at absolute zero which is minus 273 degrees on the Celsius scale. And each degree on the Kelvin scale is equal to the temperature change represented by one degree on the Celsius scale. You may remember earlier, we said that the amount of temperature change between the freezing and boiling points of water is divided into 100 equal degrees on the Celsius scale. Since minus 273 degrees Celsius is equal to zero degrees Kelvin, the conversion formula for degrees Celsius to degrees Kelvin is degrees Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273. And to convert from degrees Kelvin to degrees Celsius, it's degrees Celsius equals degrees Kelvin minus 273. So to convert the average human body temperature from degrees Celsius, to degrees Kelvin, the equation is degrees Kelvin equals 37 degrees Celsius, which is the average human body temperature, plus 273. And the answer is 310 degrees Kelvin. This chart illustrates the relationship between the Celsius and the Kelvin scales. Absolute zero minus 273 degrees Celsius zero degrees Kelvin. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius and 273 degrees Kelvin. And it boils at 100 degrees Celsius and 373 degrees Kelvin. Well, now that we've talked about the Rankin and Kelvin absolute temperature scales and how they relate to the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales, it's a good time to stop the tape. Read the text and practice converting between them. Now, if you've got any questions, ask your instructor to help you. We started the last segment by saying that temperature has a direct relationship to the motion of molecules, and that this motion is determined by the amount of heat a material contains. Now, this heat is one of the forms of energy which does work in power plants. Heat also plays a role in the energy conversion process. Knowing how this works requires that you understand the effects of heat. As we've said, the temperature of an object is a function of the heat that it contains. Hotter objects contain more heat, 
and have higher temperatures than colder objects. We found that temperature may be measured according to the amount of expansion or contraction of a material, and it may be expressed as degrees on any one of four different scales. In order to talk more concretely about heat, we must be able to talk about the units for heat in much the same way that we talk about temperature in terms of degrees. The common units for heat are British thermal units, which are abbreviated BTUs. A BTU is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. In order to calculate the actual amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a certain amount of material, we must take into account the fact that the amount of temperature increase for a given amount of heat is not the same for all materials. For instance, it takes less heat to raise the temperature of copper by a certain amount than it does to raise the temperature of water by the same amount. Now, the factor which takes into account these differences is called specific heat. The units for specific heat are BTUs per pound degrees Fahrenheit. The specific heat of water is one BTU per pound degrees Fahrenheit. And what this means is that one BTU will raise the temperature of one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. This agrees exactly with our definition of a BTU. Specific heat plays an important role when we begin calculating the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a specific amount of material by a specific number of degrees. The equation for this calculation is heat required equals the weight of the material, W, times the specific heat of the material, symbolized by C, times the amount of the temperature change, shown by delta T. We can see the effect specific heat has by comparing the heat required to raise the temperature of a certain amount of copper by a certain number of degrees with the heat required to raise the temperature of the same amount of water by the same number of degrees. We'll use three pounds of both water and copper, and we'll increase temperature by eight degrees. The heat required to raise the temperature of the water is three pounds times one BTU per pound degrees Fahrenheit times eight degrees Fahrenheit. Pounds and degrees Fahrenheit cancel, and we're left with 24 BTUs. The specific heat of copper is 0.1 BTU per pound degrees Fahrenheit. So we would expect fewer BTUs to raise three pounds of copper eight degrees Fahrenheit because the specific heat is lower. We would calculate the heat required by multiplying the weight of the copper, three pounds, times the specific heat of copper, 0.1 BTU per pound degrees Fahrenheit, times the amount of the temperature increase, eight degrees Fahrenheit. And doing the math, we get 2.4 BTUs. But that's one-tenth the amount of BTUs required to increase the temperature of three pounds of water by eight degrees Fahrenheit. Notice that the lower specific heat of a material, the fewer the number of BTUs required to raise the temperature of a material. Now, so far, we've been talking about a temperature increase. But the equation we've been using could also be used to calculate the amount of heat that must be removed from a material in order to cool it a specific number of degrees. For example, to calculate the amount of heat which must be removed from 100 pounds of water in order to cool it by two degrees, we would multiply 100 pounds times one BTU per pound degree Fahrenheit times minus two degrees Fahrenheit, and we get minus 200 BTUs. In other words, by removing 200 BTUs from 100 pounds of water, we would decrease the temperature of the water by two degrees. BTUs are the units used to measure heat with the Fahrenheit temperature scale. To use the Celsius temperature scale, you must use heat units called calories. 
A calorie is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Both calories and BTUs are ways of expressing heat, just as Fahrenheit and Celsius are two ways of expressing temperature. When heat is produced through the conversion of electrical energy, the energy that's required is usually measured in kilowatt hours. We now have three ways of expressing the energy needed to produce a specific amount of heat. They are BTUs, calories, and kilowatt hours. It may be necessary to convert between these units of energy measurement. For instance, if you were heating three pounds of water with an electric heater, you'd want to know how much electricity would be required. Well, if you're heating the water from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is boiling, you'd change the water temperature by 212 minus 70, or 142 degrees. You can find how many BTUs are required by multiplying the weight, three pounds, times the specific heat, which is one BTU per pound degree Fahrenheit, times the change in temperature, 142 degrees Fahrenheit. Doing the math gives us an answer of 426 BTUs. Now, one BTU equals 0 0.0003 kilowatt hours, or one kilowatt hour equals 3,413 BTUs. So to find how much electrical energy in units of kilowatt hours it takes to heat the water, you multiply the 426 BTUs times one kilowatt hour divided by 3,413 BTUs, which equals 0.125 kilowatt hours. But we know that the energy conversion process is not 100% efficient. So there's one more step to calculate the amount of electrical energy needed to heat the water. Let's say the electric heater is 40% efficient. That is, 40% of the electrical energy consumed is converted to heat energy in the water. We'll calculate the energy required with the equation energy in equals energy out divided by efficiency. Now, energy in equals 0.125 kilowatt hours divided by 0 0.40 and working through the equation results in an answer of about 0.312 kilowatt hours needed to heat three pounds of water from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. With a heater, that's 40% efficient. Okay, in this segment, we've talked about what heat is and how it's measured. But how is heat transferred from one place to another? Well, we'll find that out in the next segment. For now, stop the tape. Read segment 4-4 in your text, and if you have any questions, ask your instructor to help. For an object to be hot, it must receive and absorb heat. One thing we've already discovered is that heat flows from hot to cold. The question that remains is, how does the transfer of heat actually take place? Well, there are three answers to this question. Heat is transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation. Now, we'll discuss each of these methods of heat transfer individually, and then we'll look at a plant example where all three methods occur at the same time. When we talk about heat transfer, we're talking about the movement of heat from a hotter area to a cooler area. Whenever heat transfer takes place, there's usually something being heated and something being cooled. When both areas are the same temperature, heat transfer stops. For our discussion of conduction, convection, and radiation, we'll consider the situation where a substance is heated. Later on, we'll see some situations where cooling is desired. Let's look at conduction. This method depends on the direct contact of material for heat transfer to occur. 
You have had many experiences in your life which illustrate heat transfer by conduction. If you've ever worked on a car, you probably accidentally touched a hot exhaust manifold. This not only caused an immediate transfer of heat by means of conduction, but it may have also caused a painful burn. The lesson here is that heat is transferred from a hot object to a cooler object whenever they touch. Conduction also occurs through an object. One example is the conduction of heat through metal. If you've ever soldered a pipe, you've seen this principle in action. When you first apply heat to the joint, the pipe just below the joint is cool to the touch. Then as heat is conducted from the joint to the pipe, the unheated part of the pipe gets hot. This illustrates the point that conduction is a process by which heat travels from an area of high temperature to an area of lower temperature. Without some type of material to act as a conductor, conduction can't happen. Convection also requires a material through which the heat is transferred. In this case, the material must be a fluid, which could be either a liquid or a gas. Convection is accomplished by heating a fluid and then moving the fluid from the heat source. When the fluid moves, it takes the heat with it, that is, it transfers the heat. The movement of the fluid can be caused by natural circulation of the fluid or by forced circulation. A typical room radiator is an example of convection through natural circulation, while forced air heat is an example of convection through forced circulation. Here's a typical radiator. The heat from the radiator is transferred to the surrounding air by conduction. The air expands, becomes less dense, and rises, carrying the heat with it. This starts convection. Cooler air then moves in around the radiator, and the process is repeated. The result is a convection flow called natural circulation that carries the heat away. Let's compare this with a typical forced air heating system. In this system, air being pushed by a fan is drawn from the room being heated. The fan forces the cool air from the room through the furnace where it is heated. The heated air is then discharged to the room. This is convection because the air picks up heat in the furnace and carries it to the cooler room. But this is different than the radiator because a fan forced the air to circulate. In this case, the air is circulated by forced circulation rather than natural circulation. What we've said so far is that convection is heat being transferred by a fluid which picks up the heat and carries it away from the heat source. Secondly, we said the fluid that picks up the heat can be moved by natural circulation or by forced circulation. Radiation, the third method of heat transfer, does not require a substance for the heat transfer to take place. Radiation results in heat being transferred across an empty space. A common example of this is the sun. The heat from the sun comes to us across 93 million miles of space. One characteristic of radiant heat is that objects are only heated on the side which faces the radiant energy. For example, if you stand at a fireplace, your front side warms while your back remains cold. What's happening is the fire gives off invisible infrared radiation that travels out from the fire in a direct line. An object in line of sight of the flame will absorb some of the radiation hitting it. But since the back side of the object is not exposed, it receives no radiant energy. This is what causes the front to become warmer and the back to remain cold. Now, the amount of heat transferred by any one of the three heat transfer methods, conduction, convection, and radiation, depends on many factors. One factor that affects conduction and convection is the difference in temperature between the hot and cold areas. The greater the temperature difference, the faster the heat flows. The rate of heat transfer in conduction is greatly influenced by the material doing the conducting. As a general rule, 
materials which are good conductors of electricity are also good conductors of heat. For example, metals such as copper and silver are excellent conductors of both electricity and heat. While glass and fiberglass are poor conductors. Now, poor conductors are called insulators. Conduction of heat is not always desired. For example, in the main steam lines that run from a boiler to a turbine, conduction of heat to the surrounding air reduces plant efficiency because this heat is lost from the system. In order to minimize this heat loss, the pipes are wrapped with insulation. One factor that influences the rate of heat transfer by convection is the rate of circulation of the fluid. The greater the circulation, the greater the heat transfer. Convection can be significantly increased by increasing circulation by mechanical means. This is done by fans, where a gas is involved, and by pumps, where there's a liquid. The rate of heat transfer by radiation is influenced by the color of the surface receiving the radiation. Dull, dark surfaces absorb almost all of the radiation received, while light surfaces reflect most of the radiation. Well, we now have a basic idea of the three methods of heat transfer. Let's look at a boiler, where all three methods take place at the same time. Fuel and air enter the boiler furnace, where the fuel is ignited. Hot gas forms as the fuel burns and is carried out of the furnace and into the plant stack. As the hot gas contacts the water walls, heat is conducted toward the cooler water inside. This causes the water walls to get hotter, and the water inside begins to form bubbles of steam. Additional heating by radiation results from the boiler flame. This radiation only affects the part of the water walls which are in direct line of sight of the flame. Heat transfer by convection occurs as the hot gas rises in the boiler furnace. While natural circulation of the flue gas will occur, modern boilers have fans, which create a forced circulation and improve the efficiency of the convection. During the heat transfer process, temperature will rise in one substance and decrease in the other. In other words, if heat is absorbed by one substance, it must be lost by another. For instance, the temperature of the gas in the furnace is around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of the gas entering the stack is around 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This 1,750 degree Fahrenheit difference in the gas temperature is primarily a result of convection. As the flue gas moves through the furnace, it transfers more and more heat to the boiler tubes, and the gas temperature drops. As the tubes absorb heat, the gas loses heat. Then conduction carries the heat through the tubes to the water where the heat turns the water into steam. Also, considerable heat is provided by radiation from the boiler flame. In this way, all three methods of heat transfer are used to create the final product of the boiler, steam. Well, we'll stop here and let you review the text and answer the questions. In the next segment, we'll talk about heat transfer as it's used to both heat and cool plant components. Heat flows everywhere around us. Wherever there's a difference in temperature, heat flows from hot to cold. We've seen how temperature affects material. We've looked at conduction, convection, and radiation heat transfer. All of these heat transfer methods take place in almost every power plant. And the more you understand about heat, the better you'll understand how certain equipment, such as a heat exchanger, works. In order to produce electricity, a power plant must purposely control the flow of heat. A major component designed for this purpose is the heat exchanger. Heat exchangers have many different designs, but one of the most common is the shell and tube design, which regulates the exchange of heat between two fluids. One fluid flows through the shell, and the other flows through the tubes. The purpose and end result of a heat exchanger depends on the way it's used. 
Basically, heat exchangers can be used in two ways, to heat or to cool. Feed water heaters are an example of heat exchangers designed to heat. And bearing oil coolers are an example of heat exchangers designed to cool. The details of how heat transfer occurs and what affects it have a major influence on the ways heat exchangers are operated. Knowing some of these details will enable you to make more effective operating decisions. We're going to look at two examples of heat exchangers, one that heats and one that cools. Operating a heat exchanger requires you to have a basic understanding of the heat exchange process that goes on inside it. Something that is useful to understand is how the heat exchange process is controlled. Let's begin with the feed water heater. In this simplified version of a feed water heater, the feed water flows through the tubes while the steam used to heat the feed water flows through the shell. The heat from the steam is conducted through the tube walls and into the feed water. Then the feed water carries the heat away by convection. The feed water is circulated by forced circulation that is created by pumps. So there are two heat transfer processes going on in the feed water heater, conduction and convection. Now, the transfer of heat in heat exchangers can be very complicated, and we can't look at all the factors that affect it, but we will look at two of these factors, flow rate and temperature difference. These will help us get a better understanding of how heat exchangers work and how they're operated. One of the factors which affects how much heat is transferred by convection to the feed water is the flow rates of the feed water and the steam. Increasing the flow of either the feed water or the steam will result in more heat being transferred by convection. A factor which affects how much heat is transferred by conduction is the temperature difference between the feed water and the steam. Increasing the temperature difference between them results in a greater transfer of heat by conduction. Feed water flow through a feed water heater is dependent on the load on the unit. The greater the load, the greater the feed water flow. The temperature difference between the feed water and the steam is also dependent on load. As load increases, so does steam temperature. No attempt is made to regulate the heat transfer in order to keep the feed water temperature constant. The result is that feed water temperature varies with load. As load goes up, so does feed water temperature. This works fine for feed water, but in other cases, it might be desirable to maintain a constant temperature. This is usually true of the oil being cooled by a bearing oil cooler. In this bearing oil cooler, the cooling water flows through the tubes and the oil flows through the shell. This heat exchanger is used to cool the bearing oil from the main turbine. The same principles which govern heat transfer in a feed water heater also govern heat transfer in a bearing oil cooler. These are the flow of cooling water and oil and the temperature difference between them. The temperature of the oil is usually held constant. Although there will be some variations, the flow of the oil and the temperature of the cooling water are also fairly constant. This leaves adjustment of the cooling water flow as a means to control heat transfer. A valve on the cooling water outlet is opened or closed in response to the oil temperature. If oil temperature increases beyond the desired value, the cooling water outlet valve is opened a little more. This increases cooling water flow. The increased flow causes more heat to be removed from the oil and bearing oil temperature decreases. Now suppose you had everything adjusted properly. You come back an hour later and find that oil temperature has gone up. If you think about all the things which could cause this to happen, you'll know what to check. For instance, the cooling water temperature could have changed, or the load on the bearings could have increased, which would cause an increase in the temperature of the oil returning to the cooler. As you can see, there are many factors which affect what goes on in a heat exchanger. What we've learned will help you to understand why certain equipment in the plant is operated the way it is. With some experience, you'll be able to observe symptoms of problems with equipment, such as heat exchangers, and then use the concept of heat exchange to figure out the problem and an appropriate solution. 
This is not something you'll be able to do overnight. But with practice and study, you will be able to sharpen your operator skills. Well, we've seen what heat is, and we've examined some of the ways heat is used in the plant. As we've said, heat is a very big part of power plant operation, so we'll talk more about heat in later topics. For now, review the text and answer the questions. If you need help, ask your instructor.